down compared to the same period last year. And that means, of course, fewer jobs. Some are blaming Cape Town's water crisis and the onerous visa requirements. But how do we get back on target to become one of the top 20 tourist destinations within the next two years? My name is Vuyam Vogo and this is our nightly look at South Africa under the Ramaphosa administration. This is As It Happens. My guest tonight on As It Happens is uh, SA Tourism CEO, Sisa Njona. Good evening, Mr. Njona. Thanks very much for, um, for coming through. Yeah, thank you. Good evening. So what's going on? Why is our tourism industry not performing as well as everyone seems to say or to think it has a potential of doing? I think there's uh, various factors, and we just need to look at these in two separate buckets, if I can call that one. So let's start off with the international tourism side. Um, globally, it's happening. It's really improving quite well. Uh, we've seen growth from our U.S. markets, from our European markets. Even South America is going quite well. Where we've seen a bit of pressure, you know, in terms of uh, the numbers not coming through, the rate that we expect them, is from our SADC uh, region, basically, Zimbabwe, uh, Mozambique, and even Lesotho. Big one was uh, Zimbabwe. You know, when you've got currency constraints, it actually limits the flow of people between the two countries, and we've seen some pressure in that regard. But however, you know, the first quarter of this year, we've seen an upturn coming through, and we're encouraged by those results. Uh, then to look on the domestic tourism side, there's a whole lot of factors around that side. I mean, you can't take away the very sluggish economy that we have. So essentially, the tourism sector is fighting for the share of wallet <laughs> You know, alongside everything else, uh, the constant fuel price increase is also putting a lot of pressure in it because essentially tourism is about mobility. Mobility is about fuel, essentially. And uh, these all seep down into the mainstream economy there. Now, well, let's start. Uh, let's look at the, at the global um, situation um, for, um, for a while. You've lost um, visitors from the UK, for example. Um, presumably, I mean, those you already have, you know, or that have been sort of uh, boosting your numbers, mm -hmm. that stuff you hold on to. Now, once you start losing there, what hope do you have of bringing uh, more people from elsewhere? Well, the UK market is outside of the continent, it's our biggest uh, market in terms of source market. We actually flat in the UK. So we did not lose, we did not gain. And the UK is actually going through its own economic issues. The Brexit is a, is a big weight on that uh, particular space. So we've seen the UK, when you look at those numbers, there's a lot of what we call intra-tourism happening. So people are not leaving the UK, but they're actually um, staying within the UK. We monitor as long as we're not losing market share to other sectors. So if we're all remaining flat, relatively speaking, we're kind of doing okay. But we're putting more attention in those markets to make sure that we've got ease of travel between South Africa and the UK, essentially. Do you have that? Yeah, we're getting there. We're certainly getting there. Uh, what are the stumbling blocks? Well, there's a couple of issues. You know, um, you know uh, we call them barriers, essentially. Uh, one of them is a clarity around unabridged certificates, you know, especially for minors, you know. So therefore, parents traveling with kids need a lot more documentation. They actually have to prove that the children are theirs in terms of certified documents. Now, for you and I, it's very easy to go to the police station and get something certified. However, in other markets, you can't go to the police station. You actually need a barrister to actually certify your documents. That could easily cost 500 pounds per certification. So already putting up costs up front on that side. However, we've also seen some encouraging green shoots coming through. BA have just announced another route that they're putting through starting October, I think, between Heathrow and Durban, you know, um, King Shark International. And that's going to add a bit more seats on board and therefore bring more people coming on board. So, so I think it's a bit of a mixed bag, but we're looking at across the board to make sure that we become specific in removing the barriers, but also enabling in other areas. Uh, uh, how are you doing on the other markets that uh, um, had been growing nicely from what uh, we are told, like uh, China, for example? 
Well, China is the, is the world's largest source market. Everyone is a China strategy. Uh, Chinese travel in numbers and they spend. Just in 2017, 145 million international trips uh, were undertaken by the Chinese. Uh, unfortunately, we had a 17% year-on-year drop on China. And there's a couple of things. That's huge, though. It is huge. It's also quite concerning. And it's certainly something that we've elevated right across, um, you know, even to the ministry from the perspective. I think key there as well is also part of the best Areas, you know, visas. You know, Chinese need visas to travel to South Africa uh, in a population of over 1 billion people. You can imagine in terms of capacity that you need to have in order to process all these visas. So our, our efficiency in terms of uh, processing all these visas was not as what it should be. And that you can start to see coming through in the numbers as well. Then lastly, connectivity. Wait, really, just, uh, let's just stay with that point for a short. Are you saying that uh, South Africans or South Africa in China isn't able to process uh, visas or certainly not speedily or efficiently? Yeah, I mean, for the numbers that we're targeting, you know, um, you look at the capacity. So essentially, we've got 11 centers across China that actually collect visas. However, the processing hub, if I can call it that, only has three people in China. So three people are going One, through. One, two, three. Mm, absolutely. Right? People. Three people. Okay. And all of them now are processing these visas. I'm not sure what the output is on a daily basis, but you can imagine the backlog that it has and also, again, I mean, ease of travel. The, the, the issue here is not so much about visas, but it's about making them user-friendly, predictable, and consistent, so that you know that when you submit your documents, in three days or four days, you'll get an answer back, and etc. It's when, you know, it's almost like goes into a black box and you don't know what's going on. That's when it kind of creates angst. Well, but I don't know, I thought, I mean, China is part of BRICS. One would have thought that you give priority to those countries because you want uh, to, you know, facilitate investments. You want those people, um, I mean, to come here as often as, often as they can. I mean, we play hosts yeah. now now so I mean why, why then is there, aren't there conversations where um, it matters to say guys we've got to uh, deal with this situation you're costing us yeah I, th I think it's uh, it, it's it the conversations are happening across the board you're very right is that South Africa has the chairmanship of BRICS at the moment and there exists an opportunity then to kind of say well how do we further entrench our relationships with BRICS? Uh, an example of a but recent... But it's not about even relationships. Yep. Here is an industry that everybody says has got a huge growth potential, you know, while other uh, um, sectors of uh, the economy, you know, are like uh, contracting. Yep. Um, here's a sector that has got enormous scope or potential to, to grow. So it shouldn't be a casual kind of conversation. This is not about, this is not a nice to have. Yeah. 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 It, it, it's, it's a coordination across all government ministries and all government departments. Uh, for tourism to work effectively, it's not just the Department of Tourism that makes it happen. We need safety and security coming on board. We need Home Affairs to come on board. We need Department of Transport that issues the licenses. So it's the entire ecosystem coming together to make sure that we can deliver on, uh, on our mandate as tourism. Uh, certainly our minister is really leading the charge and making sure that he talks to his counterparts essentially to do just that, to make sure that the barriers that are there are actually lifted and removed. I mean, this is also very clear from, from the president's first State of the Nation address. He talked about the importance of tourism, but he also said, well, in order for us to double the jobs that are there, we've got to remove the barriers. And I think that's something that's receiving a lot of attention and pressure at the moment. But it doesn't, it doesn't sound like... I, I, know, I know the difficulty, um, you know, people who run like these agencies like you have mm. to, you know call a spade a spade. But the fact of the matter, I mean, we're having a conversation a couple of weeks ago when we're talking about the, N the NHI with the Minister um, of, of Health, where he admitted he has a huge problem that uh, we only have these are the resources at, uh, at his disposal, but the burden he has goes beyond what he can actually afford. But the conversations between, with Home Affairs, for example, the conversations with Treasury are not what they should be. So he sits there and hopelessly resigns to whatever it is that he gets given. But at the end of the day, he is the one who's going to be seen to have failed. 
The same goes for like local government. Um, for example, the minister responsible for state enterprises wants ESCOM, you know, to be, you know, that utility yeah. that delivers what it is supposed to deliver as best as it can. But the fact of the matter is that given what is happening at municipalities, that is also not going to happen. So it doesn't seem or sound like these conversations are happening where it matters. But everybody who talks about their portfolio minister will say, my minister is actually doing the best that they can. But the reality is that we're not seeing the fruits of that. Well, you're actually highlighting something that is probably endemic across uh, the public sector government space. It's not unique to tourism. We need all the bits and pieces of government to work together, to align together in order to deliver on it. It is when, you know, the, the area of control is beyond your immediate space. What can you do? You influence, you, 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 you also alert the system to what we are leaving behind and the potential that is there. Uh, working together is simply not negotiable because when, when you've got the NDP, Vision 2030, tourism is a priority sector. And essentially what it means, it's supposed to bring everyone's eyes on it to say, well, what's my role and contribution? What do I need to lift out of it? Uh, and I think that's the space that we're in. It's also when there is no consequence management, you know. So um, as long as I'm focusing virtually in my space and there's nothing that's going to be untoward on me, why should I? It is really bringing through these pieces. So, you know, the, 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 through the ministry, we are really elevating the status of tourism to actually saying we can go as far as we can however we need an enabling environment and an environment that allows it in order to deliver the results that we want okay we're in conversation with uh, Sis and Jonah, the ceo of uh, sa tourism when newsnight continues after this short ad break we're going to talk about domestic tourism is it affordable